before we dive deep into special things like these FPGAs and so on, I would like to start with the general question. Sure. Uh, what, what do you see as the major technology trends in the embedded industry yeah. that affect how people yeah. Uh, develop? Yeah, there are actually a lot of uh, really key major technology trends going on right now. Um, and a lot of them have been in flight for years, but they're really starting to accelerate. There's this notion of the internet of everything. We're connecting so many devices to the internet now. There's like 15 billion devices connected <laughs> today, and it's going to double in just a few years, right? <laughs> and all these devices have a lot more sensors uh, for measuring all their environment and understanding uh, what's around them. Uh, cameras and microphones, uh, radar, LIDAR in the cars, right? They're gathering massive amounts of data that needs to be processed, and we can't really have uh, the, the latency to send it up to the cloud anymore because another major trend is the integration of uh, intelligence in all of these devices. We're adding AI algorithms to have more smarts uh, to these devices, and they're doing a lot more uh, local analysis and decision making um, of that data real time. And so that's another huge major trend is the number of devices and the level of intelligence that's being added mm -hmm. uh, to these devices. Mm -hmm. It's pretty exciting, so, quite honestly. Of course, <laughs> yes, uh, but it's pretty demanding. So yes. what does this mean for developers? How do they need to change their approach to design systems? Yeah, yeah, now that, that's a great question. And if you look at these trends, they do bring a lot of capability, but they do have a lot of challenges. You know, first of all, you know, as I mentioned, uh, there's all of this massive amount of a data that's coming that needs to be processed, and it can all be done in the cloud. So there's a need for a lot more computation in edge devices. But edge devices are in very rugged environments, and they can't really have a, a big power profile, so it needs to be very power efficient uh, computing. And these AI algorithms are changing so rapidly. It seems like every other day there's a whole new AI algorithm. Just when you think you have your solution figured out, another neural network comes along that has a better way, right? So you have to constantly update your system um, to uh, benefit from all this technology and add those capabilities to your device. And then another big challenge is security, right? There's so many um, opportunities with this connected world, but now everybody has access to all those devices, including the bad guys. <laughs> and cybersecurity attacks are not just in the data center, it's a real threat uh, mm -hmm. for edge devices as well. Mm -hmm. there's, there's dramatic increase in things like even the, uh, you know, cyber uh, hijacking of cars, mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and a lot of infrastructure is now tied to the internet. Uh, right. Those are also at rest too. So it's really important for designers to think about how to design their systems to have that security, right? And then just the need to get to market quicker with these solutions, all of this really points for the need to have more adaptability built into the system mm -hmm. when we're designing it uh, from mm -hmm. the get-go. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I pick up one key note, keyword you mentioned, that mm -hmm. is updates. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, just this morning, my this this little device had, I think, <laughs> five updates. Sometimes it has 15. Someday, no update. So, um, why is it not sufficient to to just update the software? We have so so powerful processors and, and hardware, and yeah. uh, can't handle be that handled with software. Yeah. Well, uh, software updates, uh, that is a very powerful tool. And with the cloud now, it is very simple, right? Mm -hmm. At a push of a button, uh, within minutes, you get a lot of new uh, features and performance mm -hmm. and capability. But, um, you know, as I talked about, this growing need for more computation at the edge, especially from, a from AI, there's really been an explosion of the amount of data that needs to be processed by these uh, AI algorithms uh, ever since uh, they started having deep neural networks. So like over the last 10 years, uh, it's gone from the compute uh, performance doubling every two years to now it's doubling every three and a half months. That's like seven times faster than Moore's law. And processors today, they are really struggling just to keep up with Moore's Law because uh, there really is no more room. They've hit the power envelope and there's limited scaling of the frequency of the processors. And even using multiple cores on these devices really doesn't offer that much capability mm -hmm. um, for getting that extra performance. Mm -hmm. So we really need to start thinking about different compute paradigms like heterogeneous compute, mm -hmm. where the processor is assisted by a bunch of hardware accelerators that are doing very dedicated functions 
very rapidly so the software doesn't have to struggle to deliver all that extra performance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I follow Embedded World. I have attended every, every event since mm -hmm. 20 years. This is the <laughs> 20th event now. What, what I hear, hear every year is that the complexity is growing yes. ever and ever. Yes. And it seems to me that this trend is never stopping. <laughs> uh, and from the beginning on there was the, the saying of a software crisis. Uh, and the <laughs> software is growing more and more complex, more code lines. And it seems to me we have now a hardware crisis <laughs> as well. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, um, a heterogeneous computing environment with different uh, accelerators. Um, yeah. There are different options available how to accelerate the, the hardware. Maybe sure. we can deep dive a little deeper into that and you can, can characterize the, those Sure, uh, sure. Options we have. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, CPUs and microcontrollers, like I said, those all have the standard, you know, traditional von Neumann architecture, which is a great architecture, but it's sequential computer instructions, and you can only make it go so fast. And so, um, there are ASICs and ASSPs today, though, that take that heterogeneous uh, compute approach. Right? So they have a CPU uh, in the SOC, but then they have uh, hardware accelerators that are doing these dedicated hardware functions to get much higher performance. So you really improve the system level performance dramatically with these devices. The challenge though is, once you choose the hardware accelerator and build it in the ASIC or the SSP, that's the hardware accelerator that you have, and you can't really update it or change it. And as I said, with like AI algorithms changing so rapidly, you really need the flexibility to update those hardware accelerators. And you really can't do that with mm -hmm. ASICs and ASSPs without respinning the design. Mm -hmm. And ASIC design expense and cost is going up exponentially, and it's a very long time before you get those new device, uh, uh, devices ready for market. So another option is a GPU. And a GPU can be programmed pretty uh, straightforward, um, not quite as simple as a CPU, but it has hundreds of cores that all operate in parallel. So if you have a lot of computation that needs to be done on a bunch of different things, just do it all in parallel. Mm -hmm. Those applications can really benefit uh, mm -hmm. from a GPU. Um, the challenge though is GPUs, you know, they have hundreds of cores, but they can only do the same instruction all mm -hmm. at the same time. So if you need to do a bunch of different types of computations at the same uh, time, uh. you're kind of limited. And okay. GPUs, they're, they're kind of power hungry. They need a lot of uh, power to fuel all that performance. They can take up to 100 watts. So GPUs aren't necessarily the best devices uh, for the edge. Yes. But and there is another option. There is another option. Yes, that are FPGAs. and it's my favorite option. And yes. I know you're not neutral, <laughs> uh, but anyway, tell us more about it and how, how they work. Yes, so um, for the FPGAs, uh, they're also a parallel architecture, just like uh, the GPU but it's a programmable hardware that you can configure any way you want to, right? So if you want to have multiple hardware accelerators doing different things, mm -hmm. you can build that into the FPGA. And if you're doing uh, a neural network for a machine learning uh, algorithm and you don't need the full network, you can optimize mm -hmm. it. You can leave out some layers, you can prune the network, cut it down to exactly the size that you need. Mm -hmm. And as time changes, the algorithms evolve and you need to update your hardware accelerator, you can just reprogram the FPGA mm -hmm. and have brand new functionality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. FPGAs can be programmed quite simply. Um, they have the flexibility to be updated after they've been deployed in the field. Just like you can download new software uh, onto a CPU and get new features and capability with the software, you can download um, a binary bitstream which controls functionality for an FPGA over the cloud the same way. So if you think about it, you have the ultimate flexible system if you can download new software and new hardware over the cloud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's really kind of the paradigm we see of having maximum flexibility in systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you program these FPGAs? Uh, I know there are uh, um, tools available yep. to, to uh, translate C code into a hardware language. Mm -hmm. uh, is that an optimal way or would you say uh, it would be better to, to take a native approach? Yeah, it, it really depends on the nature of the design and the type of, uh, and the complexity of the design that you're trying to do. Um, a lot of people are very comfortable with uh, and, uh, com uh, and uh, at ease doing hardware-based design with RTL, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that are doing AI algorithms that really don't understand the hardware at all. 
In fact, they design their neural networks in a software framework that knows nothing about the hardware it's going to be implemented in. And so that's really, um, you know, in my mind, the best way for them to design. Just stay in your software frameworks like CAFE, TensorFlow, Keras, mm -hmm. whatever framework that you're used to designing your neural networks and training them, mm -hmm. just do that there and then we'll take care of the rest, mm -hmm. right? I think it's on the FPGA uh, mm -hmm. suppliers mm -hmm. to have tools that can mm -hmm. take the output mm -hmm. from the software frameworks and then compile that into the FPGA seamlessly so that there's no need mm -hmm. for the software engineers designing the neural networks to understand mm -hmm. their underlying hardware. Right, and yeah. that's really mm -hmm. actually some of the solutions that we offer at Lattice to do that because we understand <laughs> software engineers have enough uh, to worry about <laughs> to be concerned to optimize the network. They don't need to be worried about FPGA mm -hmm. hardware mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. so. Another aspect you mentioned before is security. So yes. my idea of security is if you have a microcontroller uh, with a, a, um, a secure element that's frozen in hardware, it's not like software that you can hack. Uh, so what's wrong with this approach? Uh, if, if you have a, a fixed hardware for, for securing a device. So I think at, at any given instant in time, um, you can pick a hardware architecture um, and implement it in you know, an MCU or an ASIC to do uh, that hardware protection and provide a hardware route of trust um, and, and have a secure way to boot the system. The problem is, um, cybersecurity attacks are getting more sophisticated over time. And they're getting better and better at hacking into the cryptographic algorithms that are used to protect these devices. So the hardware root of trust that's built you know, in an MCU or an ASIC, it's great for a certain period of time until the hackers figure out how to break the code and break into uh, that particular cryptographic mm -hmm. algorithm. So what you really need is the ability to update those uh, algorithms. Mm -hmm. And with an FPGA, you can get more advanced cryptography by just downloading and implementing it in the uh, programmable hardware of the FPGA. Mm -hmm. That allows you to stay current and stay ahead of uh, even some of the, mm -hmm. uh, the coming threats that are on the horizon. Right, right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are many uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, uh, that we're seeing every day. Mm -hmm. And maybe one last question sure. about power consumption. Yes. I know there are very, very power optimized microcontrollers. Mm -hmm. How do FPGAs compare with that? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. A lot of people, when they think about FPGAs, they think, oh, well, they're, they're very high performance and very high power and come in large packages. And that's true uh, for FPGAs that are doing uh, AI and doing uh, hardware acceleration in, da in the data center mm -hmm. or building uh, communications infrastructure, but there's a lot of FPGAs out there that are designed for edge applications. Mm -hmm. There are very small FPGAs that are power optimized and there are mid-range FPGAs that are performance optimized, and this allows uh, people to choose all kinds of different FPGAs mm -hmm. for their given applications. Mm -hmm. And yes, microcontrollers are designed to have you know particular very low power, but you have to look at uh, the power per computation uh, and that's really where it comes down to mm -hmm. right when you look at the amount of compute functions that you mm -hmm. have to do um, it just it may be a lower power per cycle for the NCU but you have to run the software for so long to do that same computation mm -hmm. it's actually more power efficient to do it in a mm -hmm. hardware accelerator in an FPGA okay. thank you very much Steve oh, uh, thank well you. that was uh, the keynote in a nutshell <laughs>